All right, good morning, everyone. And welcome to this Radcast of the Solution Club at the beginning of the new world. Today, we're gonna cover some amazing ground, uh, starting with a summary of the last several days of what we've been covering uh, with different individuals and groups. And um, the bottom line is this. Strap on your seatbelts, because we're going to go for a little ride. All right. So where are we riding to? We're riding to a full trajectory from where we are right now to where we want to get to. Okay. And I'm just going to kind of jump right in before getting, instead of getting all philosophical and woo woo and trying to create some grand whatever, let me just get, jump right into the tactical. Okay. And um, I really want to invite everyone to, uh, you know, add your own thoughts as we go, ask questions, et cetera, et cetera. Feel free to pause the conversation, which, or pause the recording, no problem. Um, so let's really make this a conversation. That's my request. Okay. All right. So we're all on the court. We're all in this together. Let's start with a group hug. Oh, great to see you all. Oh my goodness. Wonderful. All right. So here goes. Um, after <laughs> the 25 hour, because it totally just went for 25 hours, the block party on Friday, Saturday. After that, I had like a couple hour break, took a nap, and then we jumped on with Silish for his, um, I forget how you call it, like a round table or, uh, you know, whatever. But a bunch of us got together on Zoom like this and, uh, you know, a similar number of us. And we jammed for a full eight hours. So can you imagine a 25 hours of block party? Now, granted, Nolan gave me a five hour break in the middle of the night during which I went and got a, you know, a few hours of sleep, which was totally refreshing. And I hadn't done that for like in like the first, I don't know, eight block parties, but these last two, number nine and number 10 started doing that. And it's just been transformational. <laughs> I no longer have a 24 hour, not baton death march, but Jaman death march. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 enough of that. Okay. Anyway, but uh, but jamming for eight hours more, so that kind of pushed. You know, it was it was a good push. You know, because you know you get into the zone with these long form conversations. So anyway, we started talking about the K Mama app. K Mama is kind of nicknamed for uh, Silas's granddaughter, and um, so it's the K Mama app, K Dash Mama. M-A-M-A, -A. and um, it's based, it's built around the initial, the initial concept is that, um, you know, for ordering vegan food online, buy one, gift one. So it's like you buy a meal, and then the restaurant for every meal that you buy within a certain, you know, set of options, they will gift one of those meals to someone else. And um, I said, look, why don't we bump this up a few notches? And then imagine that we also combine it with a high volume food preparation operation so that we can deliver nutritious vegan foods to everyone at no cost to them. Make nutritious plant-based foods a basic human right. And we do this one city at a time, like for instance, the city of Louisville, Kentucky has uh, a, a very compassionate mayor, a really awesome mayor, um, who's proclaimed that his city is the most compassionate city in America. It's a very diverse city. Um, it's kind of where North meets South actually. Uh, Kentucky is right there sort of in the borderline between North and South. Kentucky was actually a divided state during the Civil War, an interesting historical fact. So it's really right there where North meets South. Anyway, um, 
we're talking about, for instance, in Louisville and in Tempe, Arizona, Mesa, Arizona, um, probably eventually Phoenix, uh, and Berkeley, California, where Jackie and Melvin and I and Melissa and Silas all hung out together in person and had a super fun time. Anyway, that in all these cities, and these would just be the first cities, we would eradicate hunger in these cities by creating a massively organized and orchestrated network that would include restaurants that are currently going out of business, folding up shop, right? They don't have customers or they don't have enough customers to be viable. Some of them are making it, but most are not. This would be able to use the capacity of these restaurants, not for, not so much for the um, individualized dining experience kind of thing, but to crank out high volumes of plant-based foods to be delivered to the far reaches of the city, whichever city we're talking about, right? And uh, just to do this in a very systematic, organized way, just food, organized food delivery so that everyone has nutritious foods. Hey, if you don't want it, if you've got plenty of food in the pantry and you know, you, you, for whatever reason you don't want our food, hey, we're not, gonna, we're not here to force it on anyone. We just wanna offer it to everyone without exception. Right. I don't care if you're homeless. I don't care if you live in the in the biggest house in the city. Right. Whatever the case, we have food for you. Right. And we eradicate hunger. We eradicate malnutrition. And not only that, these plant based meals would be um, really well designed. <laughs> right. Uh, from a culinary and a nutritional perspective and even an immunological perspective, as these would be immune-boosting plant-based foods. I mean, if we're gonna do it, let's do it right, right? Let's do it right. So, um, and we have Dr. Priya, I forget, I forget her last name. Jackie, if you remember, just let me know, but it's, it's okay. Um, but- uh, Nate, Nate, Nate? Something like that. N-A-I-K. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. Um, let's just say, I'll just call her Dr. Priya because that's how we all, uh, anyway, um, so between Dr. Silish leading the whole thing as our, you know, I, I presume he would be game to lead the whole of it. Um, I see no indication to the contrary, but I can't speak for him. See, so much of this is, it's just in the, in, we're in the idea co-creative realm right now. We're putting together the whole of this big picture. And remember, I, I promised you an arc. Okay, so in this arc, along this trajectory, there are some highlight milestones, okay, or just some bright spots along the way that kind of mark the way. One of them is veganism, plant-based foods. Another one is ending hunger. Another one is stopping the spread of COVID, coronavirus, right? And um, another one is bringing us all together in community and as a collective intelligence. So that we can accomplish a whole bunch of wonderful things together. Starting with the eradication of hunger and the eradication of pandemics. Because whatever the next pandemic that starts to bubble up somewhere, like, you know, like the Los Angeles Lakers, we suddenly just spring into formation. Toom. Form of, you know, nutritious vegan foods delivered to all. We do like China, but the whole world. Why can't the whole world be like China? I can't think of a single reason. There's absolutely no reason. And what this does, it creates a platform for ongoing health and safety. Look, if there's no pandemic in the air, fine. Go out, go to the tapas bars, rub elbows, dance in Havana all night long, sweating and, and drinking. Go for it, right? But 
the moment any sort of pandemic starts to flare up anywhere, we just go into boom, we go into lockdown, right? So this, this it, it, you could call it the pill bug, Operation pill bug. You know, pill bug could be walking along, walking along. Suddenly something starts to shift around. It, it, you know what? Boom. It just goes into, it just goes into a sphere and protects itself. So we, we'll have a way to protect ourselves ongoingly. And we'll simply make this an ongoing, you know, human right. Look, there'll be families that'll say, look, you know what? I really appreciated your, all the food deliveries during the pandemic, but now that it's over, you know, we're back to work. We're happily back to whatever. And you know what? We don't need the deliveries anymore. Fine. No problem. We only want to deliver to those who want it, right? Again, there's no forcing it on anyone or pressuring, nothing of the sort. But we simply want three times a day for every human being on, on Mother Earth to have a meal offered to them, hot and ready, right? As a basic human right. They can always say, hey, no thanks, I'm meeting over at my friend's house or my auntie's or fine. It's here, offered, right? Let that be a basic human right. Let's just think about that for a minute. Because we've been raised in a world that's basically, you know, the Hunger Games, but at a planetary scale. If you're lucky and you're privileged, you eat three times a day. in a world where we have way more than enough food, we feed the vast majority of it, a majority of it to enslaved animals who are raised, killed, often very young, and eaten by humans, privileged humans. And that's destroying life on Earth. It's destroying the biosphere. And it's the main, the main, the single main driver of climate change. Um, so we have an opportunity to holistically and simultaneously, because this is all going to happen very fast, solve our easily our three, four biggest problems very, very quickly. Um, our single most urgent problem as, as life on earth, just as life as a whole, regardless of species or whatever, but our single biggest problem is exponential planetary overheating because uh, of the vicious cycle that we're in. That's why it's the, it's the single biggest problem. It's not like we're all on fire right now and there's no food being grown anywhere and we're all burning up. No, but we're on, we're on track to getting there in a few years at the exponential rate we're going. Not at the linear rate we're going, but at the exponential rate we're going. So that's our single most urgent problem. But I and I would say right up there in urgency is hunger itself. Um, and also the pandemic, because the pandemic and hunger, um, along with a, abrupt climate change, they all three of those destable society. Hunger destabilizes it because hungry people will ultimately go out there and beg, borrow, or steal. And that can become the source of a lot of violence. Um, the pandemic is, of course, driving economic shutdown, including agricultural shutdown, right? And that just is bringing less food to market. No matter how you, how, how you slice it, there's less food on offer now. And so it all plays together. And of course, the economic contraction is also causing an immediate loss of global dimming and therefore rising temperatures. Guy McPherson's latest tweet yesterday reads, you know, we've now crossed two degrees centigrade. That threshold that scientists told us as far back as the 80s, thou shalt not cross this point. Actually, back in the 80s, it was like one degree or one and a half. They kept moving the goalposts, but they didn't move them after two degrees. Like no one's 
Yeah, you haven't heard of any. They, they tried to move the other goalposts. They tried to move the baseline. So they keep trying to mess with the numbers. But, but no matter how you slice it, we're in exponential uh, planetary overheating. The good news is this, everyone. And this, is, this really sums it all up. By humanity coming together and really radically changing the game, where the new game starts with a foundation where everyone eats preferably nutritious plant-based foods, um, having pioneered the legalization of cannabis, I'm not a proponent of prohibition of anything. That's just not how to make it, how to, how to make it work. Um, but um, I think that through the right mix of policies, we can, drastically reduce and ultimately eliminate um, the, the, the unnecessary killing and eating of animals. And I'll just leave it at that uh, as far as diet. Um, but really what we're talking about is compassion on multiple levels, compassion for people, making sure everyone is fed, compassion for animals, making sure they're not killed, Compassion, therefore, for Mother Earth, letting her bounce back, letting nature go back to nature um, rather than deforesting so that we can grow monoculture to feed animals which get slaughtered, right? Um, so through this program, we heal people, we heal communities, and we heal the planet. And as we, you know, really embrace this state of healing and this movement of healing and all together now everyone joining in and participating as a volunteer as a donor as a farmer you know we all, we've all heard the stories about crops just getting plowed over because there's no one to pick the crops right or there's or the the, the vital links in the supply chain to get those crops to market have been broken be it all the restaurants that are shut and are therefore no longer placing purchase orders for fresh produce, no one to buy the stuff, no one to pick the stuff, no one to ship the stuff, distributors that are shutting down. So um, what, we're, what we're really talking about here is holistically revitalizing, reinvigorating, restarting, jumpstarting, kickstarting, the food, uh, the food production and distribution networks. Except one thing that we're letting shut down on its own, we're letting die on the vine, is animal agriculture, factory farming. It's 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 dying by natural causes. The in the sector is dying. My heart goes out for all the animals who are dying and being killed. But as a sector that sector needs to die. Factory farming needs to die as a sector, right? So, but aside from that sector that's dying on the vine right now as we speak, we're revitalizing everything else that's good. Every aspect of agriculture that's good. Organic agriculture, great. Now, can it be done better? Yes. Edible living forests. Edible living organic natural forests. What if, you, what if I live in New York City between 43rd Street and 12, whatever? There's no forest here, Jack. All right. Well, rooftop gardens, permaculture, indoor, outdoor, window box, right? Growing up the size of buildings. Let's get creative. And, and we have gotten creative in this regard. So we've got a lot of, a lot of solutions are just off the shelf, ready to go. Whether you order a kit um, like Let Us Grow uh, or online or whether you DIY, do it yourself at home, right? There's lots of great material out there. Um, so when I say revitalize agriculture, I mean it in the holistic sense, right? To some degree, we've grown dependent on, you know, monoculture organic, right? And, you know, Maybe we keep that going for a while. It really has to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, but also on a holistic basis. What is the strategy as a whole, right? Um, and so 
with what we're talking about, um, so building off of Silish's buy one, gift one meal program, I put on the table this morning in our meeting, Silish and I and Dr. Priya and John Raymer all got together to you know brainstorm this a bit more. And um, yeah, we were on for like an hour and 40 minutes this morning. It was awesome. And we're digging in and getting into it. And I said, look, in addition to buy one, get one, let's also have, uh, well, first let me, let, me, let me say exactly what that means and give like a numerical example, right? So buy one, get one, let's say a family orders a meal and it's like 50 bucks and they, it's delivered. Okay, 50 bucks. Of the 50 bucks that the restaurant receives, let's just say, that like 30, 30 bucks of that is operating margin, right? Basically 30 more bucks, you know, let's say they have to spend 20 bucks between raw materials, you know, ingredients really, <laughs> raw materials, what is this, a factory? Ingredients, you know, labor, energy, you know, you know the drill, all the costs. Let's say 30 bucks are left over as operating margin. Well, they take that 30 bucks and use it to deliver another meal to someone else, right? that you've gifted it to, right? And it could be to someone anonymous. You just say, hey, look, I'm just gifting it. So if someone, co family comes along and they need a meal, hey, here it is. So that's buy one, uh, gift one. I then put on the table, hey, what if we introduce another alternative that goes like this? Buy one, gift 10. All right, let's go back to the example. Now, just, just bear with me and you'll see how this will work. Because, but you have to open up your mind. So forget about everything that's, just, just erase your, erase any, any previous assumptions and, and just start with me from zero. I order a, a meal online for my family and it's 50 bucks and it says buy one, get 10. I'm like, okay, well, here's my 50 bucks. I get my meal. All right, so how are you gonna then deliver 10 meals based on my $50 contribution, which now you've already spent 20 bucks, the same 20 bucks delivering my meal to me and my family. Now a restaurant, you've got 30 bucks left over. How are you gonna take that 30 bucks and turn it into 10 meals? Here's how, totally different model. Instead of the restaurant buying the ingredients, the ingredients are donated. Who does the donation? I'll get to that in a minute, okay? So hold your thought on that one. The foods get donated, the ingredients get donated, the restaurant receives all the ingredients, prepares it, cooks it, prepares it, whatever, in bulk, high volume, right? I'm talking big, mega vegan stew, high protein, nutritious, tasty, just the right spices. Mm. Mm. right maybe some fresh veg options right thrown in so you know imagine you deliver like an amazon fresh size big plastic reusable tote you know an industrial plastic box you know the kind that just fold open put whatever you want inside fold it closed put it on a truck whatever okay imagine you deliver one of these to a family and boom it's like food for the week it's got like this big tub of you know vegan stew and this and that and you know just great stuff for a family of three for the whole week okay that's three times seven that's 21 meals right there bam right but imagine we do this for whole neighborhoods so you got trucks going out to the neighborhoods full of these totes so you do one weekly delivery rather than doing like, you know, 21 deliveries a week. Let's do one delivery a week, you know, that, or maybe two, that kind of thing. Fred, yes, go ahead. Does that mean you eat the same thing for the entire week? You know, that's a really, that's a really good point. So maybe instead of having one giant thing of stew, it would have, you know, three different things of stew, right. To vary it up, et cetera. So good, good question. You know, we're in the process of figuring all this out. So all these questions are valid. And please don't assume that anything is figured out, right? Other than that we need to do this and that we can do this. Okay, so this is how the restaurant basically with zero ingredient cost, all it's doing is it's taking now the 30 bucks, right? That it made from that one, you know, buy one gift 10. And it's taking that 30 bucks and it's spending it on 
energy to heat the food or to power the refrigerators or whatever, right? And labor and probably delivery or maybe someone donates the delivery service. Maybe some trucking company or something is contracted by some wealthy person who says, hey, good, I'm gonna fund that. Um, ultimately, I think we can get the whole thing to work via gift economy where there's really a whole new currency here that's about sharing. The wonderful gift of sharing. And it's a gift to the person who receives, but it's also a gift to the person who gives. Because what could make you feel better than sharing? Look, humanity for the last 10,000 years since the agricultural revolution, I'll sum up the last 10,000 years of history. You can, you can compost all your history books because here's the, here's, the, here's the nutshell. It's been like a bad acid trip. And it's been this competitive game of hoarding. I eat, you don't, right? You know, and the worst, the worst of the worst of it are, you know, gets to like rape and slavery and just these horrific forms of humans mistreating and dominating and killing other human beings, right? So we've been on this bad acid trip where that's the norm and basically I'm saying, look, let's all go into group rehab and the way the group rehab works, it's not one of those rehabs where you go into some building and stay there for three months and then they, and then they let you out, all rehabbed out. No, it's rehab through volunteer work, rehab through giving, rehab through, because what we're doing is we're rehab, rehab, rehabilitating not just the individual, but society as a whole, the entire human family our entire species and all other species and ecosystems, right? How are we gonna rehab them? Well, first step, stop killing them. Duh, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's pretty basic. Stop killing them and instead focus on healing, right? And we look at the whole thing holistically, including how do we, you know, how do we support these edible living forests? How do we support nature going back to nature, land going back to nature, et cetera? And it's in this new framing where we're all, you know, embracing this new game. Because quite frankly, either we, you know, when I say all, I'm really talking about 99% of us, you know, fine, there might be like, I don't know, one or 2% holdout, right? So when I say all, what I really mean is the vast majority, right? And I don't know what that percentage is. Let's not even go there, right? But speaking in broad brush stroke, in broad brush strokes, either we all get this and do it, or we're all going to perish, So for those, you know, tribes and groups and whatever segments of society for who are really committed to, you know, being in conflict with one or more other groups, that needs to be let go of in order for this to work. We need to actively, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Fred. I'm just wondering, I mean, one, I'm wondering about where the, the first um, infusion of money comes from to get this thing rolling. And then, you know, it's kind of like, I look at the Arab-Israeli conflict, who's gonna be, who's gonna be the brave one to take the first step and, you know, risk whatever. I mean, which hoarders are going to say, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give give my wealth to get this started." I mean, yeah, there's there's just there's a lot of bravery involved in this. There's a lot of uh, trust, and it's a difficult time for all of that. Anyway, just a thought as we're moving along. 
Well, I got, I got two answers for you, Fred, and I'm going to tell them in the form of two little mini stories. The first one is called Stone Soup. The second one is called Hoarders Without Borders. Okay. First, Stone Soup. Um, we all know the story. Raise your hand if you don't know the story, and I'll tell the story. I'll sum it up. And really don't, and, and, and people need to stop getting hung up about raising their hands when I ask questions like that, because I need to make sure everyone's on board. All right, so assuming everyone uh, knows about Stone Soup, the story, um, one of the biggest lessons of that story is that you don't have to have all the ingredients lined up on a pretty 20 foot long, four foot deep cutting board to say, all right, is everything ready? Is everything in place? Nothing's missing. One of the biggest lessons is just start. Not just do it, but just start. And so, for example, here's how I imagine us starting this, right? We do some sort of, I hate to use the example of Kickstarter because that's like a for-profit business. <laughs> you know, you're giving a cut to this for-profit pack of hoarders <laughs> in order to play. But you know, but I'll just use it as a generic example and we'll find the right platform to do it. But basically imagine a Kickstarter, right? Where we raise enough for uh, between don food donations and money donations and volunteer donations. And frankly, the money that comes in through the app uh, that the restaurant accumulates and, you know, there'll be you know, some auditing, I'm sure, to make sure that they're playing by the rules and all that. But through all these different sources of resources, we start in one city, right? Um, and the ones that we're talking about right now are Berkeley, California, Louisville, Kentucky, Mesa, Arizona, and Tempe, Arizona, right? Um, but first of all, the app, K-Mama, would, would be operable in all cities around the world, right? You know, once it's thoroughly tested and really vetted and ready to go, boom. Uh, download the app and you're good to go. But focus on one, two, three, one, two or three cities for, ver for the very initial launch um, with intense focus and effort, channel a whole bunch of donations so that we get truckloads of rice, beans, potatoes, produce, right? Quinoa, hemp hearts, all these nutritious, high protein, high amino acid, immunity boosting, right? And I'm not a nutritionist, so I'm gonna omit the next 17 words that I should be using, right? But I don't know them, so I'm not using. Anyway, all those good things, um, and we come up with a really awesome menu, meal planning, et cetera. And um, uh, get the foods donated, get the funding, uh, whatever funding is needed, and get out there and start, right? If it's Louisville, Kentucky, maybe we, you know, start with five different neighborhoods that are, you know, 20% of the city. Okay, it's a start. Let's start with the neighborhoods that, that, that need it the most. right? In the end, we'll go to the rich neighborhoods and say, hey, you know, sorry to leave you till last, but the reasons are kind of obvious. Here you go. Better late than never, right? You hungry? <laughs> right? Uh, I don't need donations. Well, shoot, then, you know, ante up some money. Donate. Take the food and give us some money, right? So, um, you know, like that. And once we make it work for one city, every city is going to want it. Every city is going to demand it. Right? And we'll now have a playbook, an evolving playbook for how to feed everyone. There will be farmers who will say, hey, look, I'm just glad that I can grow this food. So if someone else will donate the gasoline, the diesel, so I can run my tractors. And if volunteers will come pick the produce, 
I'm happy to donate my time, right? And here's the thing. The first billionaire to donate a billion bucks to this program. Number Two things. One, they're going to be famous. And number two, um, they're going to set the bar for the other billionaires to jump over. And no more excuses. And then that, remember I promised you two stories, Stone Soup and Hoarders Without Borders? All right. So um, along with Operation Stone Soup, getting out there and doing this, let's interview those hoarders who choose not to participate. And let's, you know, let's hear their logic. Let's hear their story. And let's not just lim limit it to hoarders in the United States. That's, that's why it's called Hoarders Without Borders. Let's interview hoarders throughout the world, right? And um, <laughs> it's, it's actually embarrassing, but I mean, there are people I've known um, and that I've, you know, that I've been, I'll just say I've been friendly with, because it's really hard to be really true friends with such people. Um, but among the very wealthy folks I know, um, there is a portion of them who actually believe that it's wrong to donate to the poor. And, you know, like this one dude who's like, I don't know, a multi-hundred millionaire. And we've, we've done some business together um, and we've, you know, we've become friendly until I said to him, hey, listen, you know, I'm working on this thing that it ought to end hunger and all that. And he said, well, you know, it's actually been demonstrated that it hurts them to donate food to them. And um, all this has been really thoroughly analyzed by this professor at Harvard, dot, dot, dot. So this dude at Harvard writes these books and gets on these lecture, the lecture circuit of the sociopaths because he provides them justification for not donating to help the poor. And that's how perverse it's gotten. So you know what? Let's start the program, Hoarders Without Borders, and let's hear their side. All right, what, it will, what has the Harvard professor got? What would he say if he came to Louisville, Kentucky and saw us feeding everyone? Would he say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Stop doing that. You're hurting these people. You're enabling them to not work or something. You know, whatever the BS narrative is, right? Well, part of the reason that that narrative is now flying straight out the window is because there is no economy in which to go out and get work. The economy is broken, right? The economy is broken. It doesn't work. And even if it did work, what has it resulted in? A carnivorous lifestyle, meat everywhere, planetary destruction, everything packaged for single use, this, that, the other. You go to Costco, it's triple packaged. Packaging inside of packaging inside of packaging, right? Whereas as we make this transition to this new model of high volume, foods delivered in reusable packaging, right? We transform everything. We make it vastly more efficient. And, um, and by the way, there's not a one size fits all solution to this. Certain parts of the world are gonna lend themselves much more to the edible living forest, permaculture, you know, hydroponics in your house, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that, and w pointing to that guest who we had on the Solution Club a few weeks ago from Austria, who showed us that solution that they're pioneering. Um, anyway, all I'm saying is there's no one size fits all. It depends on so many factors. You know, density of the urban population in the case of a city, right? Access to rooftop, access to this, that, you know, access to light. Um, are we doing it with light bulbs? Are we doing it with sunlight? How are we doing it? There's so many factors and it's going to be the, and the mix of solutions is going to be constantly evolving. But all I'm saying is with all that in the mix, we have the ongoing challenge and opportunity of finding the optimal balance where we 
guaranteed that everyone gets fed, right? And I'm sure we've all heard these stories about, well, part of the reason you have hunger in parts of Africa is because there's dictators that don't let the food get through. Well, then let's go take out those dictators. If that's really the case, if someone is intentionally starving, you know, millions of people or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands or even one person, right? We need to go find the culprits and bring them to justice, right? I mean, that's what military interventions should be for. And only, only stuff like that, that are really, truly humanitarian interventions. All right. Um, and, you know, at this point, you know, the world really divides itself into, into two camps. Volunteers and supporters on the one hand and hoarders without borders on the other. See, we bifurcated. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? And what's going to happen is the other side, the hoarders without borders, it's going to become increasingly untenable, right, in this present world of billions of people, a collapsing economy, pandemics, exponential planetary overheating, destruction of the biosphere, crop failures, which, are, which, are cor which go hand in hand with exponential planetary overheating. Um, we simply urgently need to make this phase shift into this whole new modality, a whole new, basically a whole new formation of species that operates like an ant colony, I'm just going to say, like my idealized conceptualization of an ant colony, right? Um, which operates much more as a colony than as a species of 8 billion individuals who are fundamentally competing with each other. A colony that's all about working together. James brother from Cork, Ireland. Welcome back. Great to see you. All right, yeah. All right man. Sorry again, Leif, but you carry on. Carry on. I'm no, sorry. no worries. Don't don't worry about it, brother. I'm just I'm just super happy you're here. Um, and uh, we're we're in the middle of a of recording uh, a summary, so I'll just carry on, and, and I know you'll 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 pick up just fine. Um, but we're 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 talking about. Uh, organized, we're, we're talking about completely revamping and refreshing and resetting the food networks of the world, from farming to distribution to food preparation to delivery, um, where basically these restaurants that are, that are closing their doors and going bankrupt, we give them a whole new purpose and a way to stay viable. Um, and um, we, and likewise with the farms, uh, you had brought to our attention, James, these farmers having to plow their produce under because they didn't have anyone to pick it, pick the produce. So we would organize teams of volunteers with the appropriate supervision, equipment, safety precautions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to pick the produce without getting sick or spreading sickness. Right. And then uh, likewise with uh, transportation of that food uh, to the restaurants, the restaurants would do the food preparation in very high volumes, super efficient and deliver the foods to families, maybe a couple times a week with a sufficient variety of foods. Go for it, James. Yes. Yeah. Um, again, you know, I, I just uh, reiterate on the point they made about the crops being plowed into the ground. They are being plowed into the ground again, but it, they're not being plowed into the ground because they can't be picked. That was a separate matter, as I remember uh, said there last time. The, the, the picking side is uh, the issue was about the um, about the migrant workers coming in. They normally do the picking and everything else. And Trump was after uh, you know after lowering the wages again, like so. Basically, they might as well have slaves. Um, 
but uh, they're forcing out the pickers. And the problem with the reason why they're plowing the crops in then, that's in Florida where they were plowing the crops in. The pickers problem is in California as well as I know that area. The Florida area is dealing with the having to plow the crops in because the infrastructure is set up that a certain amount of the produce is produced for the industry, like the restaurants on bulk and all these bulk foods and everything else. It's the same with the toilet roll issue. There's no toilet roll shortage. It's just that majority of toilet roll is used during the day by people in offices, at work, in schools, colleges, and all these. And that's industrial toilet paper. It's a little not as comfortable or luxurious as your home toilet paper. So there's two different infrastructures there for it. So they have loads and loads of surplus toilet paper that should be in offices now, but they don't have the they don't have the way of dealing with that by giving it to the domestic market. Same with the food. They just because of the um, because of the res restrictions and everything else, the infrastructure for collecting the vegetables and everything else and delivering them to be processed and to be delivered to the stores and everything. And because uh, you know that's that infrastructure is after breaking down, therefore they have no other choice but to plow the cro crops back into the ground to get ready for their next crops because they you know they have no other choice but to do it because there's no infrastructure they have to deal with it once it comes out of the ground. So the two separate issues, the wages is the migrant worker of California issue and uh, Florida was the one where I saw the news, art news article about them plowing the food in, but that's not a, a localized issue by any means. It's happening in a lot of places in America now. Uh, it's, uh, it's happening in, in Europe as well. There's a lot of uh, infrastructure for industry and then a complete separate in infrastructure for the domestic scene. So that's what the problem is. That's it. Go ahead, Kelly. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, no, that's that's super helpful. Thank you, James. And um, so uh, I'm really glad you 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 brought up that example of the infrastructure uh, and the demand from the restaurant sector col having collapsed, and so all these fields that were growing for restaurants, th there's simply no demand. No demand. Now. Can they try to channel it into the retail channel? I'm sure. I'm sure they're trying the best they can. But um, you mentioned a key term, which is infrastructure. What what we're seeing is whole system breakdown. And I think we need to call a spade a spade, right? You know, when you go when you go to the doctor because you have some pain and something is just not right, you don't tell the doctor, hey, look, I don't want to know the truth. I just want, just give me something to make me feel good or tell me a story that will make me feel good. No, you want to know the truth and you want to deal with the truth. At the species level, it's exactly the same. We need to face the reality that we're in various different stages and processes of whole system breakdown. And even if there were no pandemic, no economic hiccups, right? And even no hunger, we still have exponential planetary overheating, which will wipe us out in a couple of years, right? Wipe us out. So no matter how you slice it, we are in the midst of whole system breakdown. Do you remember the original Star Wars movie, episode four, 1977? The original, original, where they blew up the Death Star at the end. Okay. Do you remember halfway through the movie during the trash compactor scene? Who could forget that, right? The reality is we are in the trash compactor scene of life on Earth, okay? Certainly complex life. Um, and just like in the movie, the way out of the trash compactor scene, C-3PO shut down all the garbage compactors on the detention level. Shut them all down. Shut them all down. Right? Well, in, in our case, who is our C-3PO? You ready for this? Who's our C-3PO? It's us, the collective intelligence. It's the collective. So here's how it all fits together, okay? 
as we go about rolling out these solutions for eradicating hunger through the, the preparation, the sourcing, preparation, and delivery of whole foods, plant based diet, right? That boosts immune systems and all that. What's going to happen is we're basically going to be signaling to humanity through our actions, but also articulating to humanity through our words that look, this is the dawn of a whole new era for humanity where all people will be taken care of regardless of whether you work or not. And vast opportunities for volunteering will open up. And if you've hoarded a bit too much wealth, well, you've got some time now to think about it and loosen up the purse strings, right? Or join hoarders without borders, right? And make your case there. Right? Are you a proud hoarder like Donald Trump? Great, make your case. Let them make their case. It'll be like a reality television series. Right? Basically, a bunch of assholes, you know, gloating over how much they've hoarded and how it's damaged their American right. And I also got a bunch of guns and ammo, you know. All right. Well, welcome to Hoarders Without Borders. And it's really great to hear your perspective so we know what we're dealing with here. You damn rat! You know, okay. I, I think that segment of society will go extinct, right? It'll kind of dr dry up and shrivel up and die under its own filth, right? Because the party is going to be at the block party. And, you know, basically the world will become one big ongoing block party that's catered, right? People will be on their Zoom video conferences, contributing to the collective super intelligence. And this is actually key. This is a key part of it. We will all be hanging together, eating together, eating the same nutritious, immune boosting, healthy, plant-based, whole foods. We are steps away from getting there. Why do I say that with such confidence? Look, just like with stone soup, and the big lesson there is start, just start. So just like with stone soup, the key operative word was start. How do we start this? We're starting this by taking one, you know, small to medium sized city and telling the world this is what we're doing because you know what's gonna happen? This way the world can contribute to it, right? I may be sitting in Mumbai, India and learn about what they're doing in Berkeley, California and say, yeah, we can contribute 50 bucks to that. No problem. 50 bucks here, 100 bucks there, million bucks there, billion bucks there. Because the billionaires are going to see a huge opportunity to be the first one to donate a billion bucks to ending hunger. And watch that get deployed and voosh, city after city after city after city, we're ending hunger. And then the next billionaire will come along. Donate 5 billion because they want to make their mark, right? You know, Jeff Bezos committed 10 billion to climate change. All right, Jeff, we need another 10 billion over here and we will go so far to eradicating hunger, it will make the world's head spin. And the world will say, wow, this is awesome. We need this everywhere. All right, well then donate, volunteer. If you're a farmer, you know, tell us what you need. We'll get that for you. And donate your food, your surplus. Stone soup. It works and it will work. We got to believe in it. And we've got to put together all the infrastructure to make it work.
And it all starts with one city. In the story Stone Soup, it started with one pot. And they didn't even have to come up with the pot. They borrowed it from someone, right? And one of the soldiers went down to the river and borrowed a stone from Mother Gaia, who was happy to loan it. Some water, firewood, all donated or gathered. That's another huge part of the story. They did not have a penny to contribute to the project, but they had the intention, the commitment, the creativity, and the ability to tell a story. All right, Emery has written a couple of things and also Myra. Okay. Um, Emery, I'm going to read what you've written unless you'd like to. It's up to you. Go ahead, Jim. Okay. So you write, there could be a pick it up at the counter, call in to order it, numbered orders, helps to verify you got your food today. Yeah, pickups is one way, but but you know what's more efficient? Like, let's say that there's a neighborhood that's like a mile away from the restaurant. The restaurant sends out, rather than, you know, 500 families from that neighborhood, each getting in 500 cars and driving to do the pickups, um, imagine that one truck goes with 500 of those boxes to that neighborhood, opens up the back doors, right? And delivers house by house, right? And in fact, even smaller vehicles, all the way down to bicycles, right? Delivery bicycles, they could load up three or four boxes on the back of their bicycle trailer and down the street they go. Make the deliveries, come back for more. Make the deliveries, come back for more. So. All that can be done very efficiently and in a way that minimizes the number of human beings who need to leave their house. Because part of the point of all this is to make it so that people don't need to leave their homes. The vast majority of the, reason, of the trips that people make from their home out into the world and then back home is to get food. That's it. And that's how China defeated uh, the coronavirus. Sorry, I'm supposed to be using the code word Dos Equis. So back to Dos Equis. That's how China defeated Dos Equis, right? By mandating that everyone stay at home and delivering them food. If you do it at scale, it becomes incredibly efficient. And as the story, Stone Soup, we could call this Operation Stone Soup. As the story of Stone Soup unfolds, right? More and more people will get inspired to join and donate and volunteer and participate. Restaurants, food distributors, farmers, pickers, Bicyclists, truck drivers, drivers. Um, can I make a small point? Is that okay? Oh my goodness, of course, Stephanie, please. Um, I might be going a little bit off the subject, but it's, I'm just keep thinking about um particular charities that I know that are similar to this. Um, like Jackie, I believe is Seeds to Inspire is something at the moment. And uh, I have personal friends of mine from Nepal when I was there and I have donated to them in the past, but they are actively in a third world country doing things a group of people where I know if I donate to them, 100% of the money is going to, and there's a lot like that volunteers and a lot of people volunteer. So, with the current uh, 
I forgot your code code word, but with the current situation, um, a lot of these people are now struggling because they don't have the volunteers and people can't get together and stuff. Uh, so I wonder, should could we or should we start by uh, making that more of aware that people need like can help more with these charities and they need the help more than ever as well because we're down on um man time and uh, people who are actually able to cook it and deliver it and like for example in Nepal uh, again the group I know they they also feed uh, kids orphan kids and um, for example they can feed the whole orphanage for 60 US dollars a month and that's all they're short like you know and if I had it myself I'd give them 6,000 right now so then I know all those kids are fed for so long so maybe that's something as well that we can help uh, is reach out to these charities that do exist and uh, maybe collab or something or get together but help people like, be that be aware as well like because of these small charities we don't hear about where not these big charities where all the money for profit and all this like the, the ones that uh, again rely on manpower and volunteers um and more than ever need our help now as well just to put that out there it just kept going through my mind as we were talking about the idea. Yeah, I love it. Um, so, let's talk about these charities and these various nonprofits because they're a really important part of the equation. Um, remember how a bit ago I was talking about how we're experiencing whole system breakdown. The whole system is breaking down. And um, that includes the nonprofit sector. Because, um, hey, Natalie, welcome. Welcome, Natalie. Great to see you. And James, I see you got your hand up. I, I assume that's a fresh new hand up. Um, so I'll get to you in a moment. I just want to finish commenting to, to Stephanie and to everyone here that part of the breakdown is see these nonprofits have essentially been competing with each other, trying to get more donations for them and therefore less for their competitors, right? So they don't collaborate very well. Um, and also now they can't now they're not getting the donations because nobody's working no one's generating revenue everyone's um running out of money and running out of food right this is part of the whole system breakdown so we need a whole system redesign right and here's what i'm not proposing what i'm not proposing is all right everybody you know on saturday night at eight o'clock at the count of three, let's all burn our money and we'll go to a money free system because, you know, then the people who burn their money suffer and everyone else doesn't suffer. Um, or, you know, uh, all of a sudden, you know, scrap the nonprofit sector. We don't need them. It's part of this old money system. No, no, no. I'm not saying any of that. Here's what I am saying. Rather than try to fix this and that and these other big parts of society all at once, let's start with a hyper-focus on just making sure everyone gets food to eat. That's all. Now, how do we do that? Well, it's the answer is definitely going to involve the nonprofit sector. But for all the reasons you mentioned, Stephanie, they're hurting right now. So perhaps part of the whole system redesign is that the movement that will bring this redesign to life and get it up and running in its new form, this movement could very well include a decentralized call center, a virtual call center where Somebody who wants to volunteer can call in and talk with a volunteer coordinator who can answer all their questions about safety and compensation for transport or whatever they need, whatever specifics the volunteer needs. 
right? And the different volunteer opportunities. Maybe they can volunteer from home, right? And we're basically gonna, what's, what's basically happening is uh, little by little, and hopefully sooner rather than later, humanity is waking up to the fact that either we hang together or we're gonna hang separately, right? And more and more of us every day are choosing to come together and hang together. Woo, big applause to all of us. Anyway, um, in practical terms, what does this mean? Well, we've been talking about collective superintelligence. We can do this very practically by organizing a series of meetings, both in this venue, the Solution Club, but mostly in the block party, because we've got a lot more time then, a lot more flexibility. Um, but imagine that we have separate meetings, and, and these could even be going on in parallel as breakout rooms, but we have separate meetings, separate recurring conversations, ongoing series of conversations that meets by default, say, twice a week on the following topics. Ready? I'm going to read through a list of about 15 topics. Okay. Medical and healthcare. Nutrition recipes and meal planning. This is all in the context of ending hunger through delivering um, these foods. And James, I know you got your hand up and thanks for your patience. Actually, I'm gonna let James talk first and then I'll go through the topics. But where I'm going is that we can organize as a collective intelligence and master this whole space from all these perspectives, all these different topical perspectives and perspectives of communities such as the nonprofit sector. Anyway, more on that in a few minutes. James, back to you, brother, and thanks for your patience. No, you're grand, Jim. Carry on, Norman. You're, um, you're actually kind of more or less covering what I was kind of going to make a point about. And, uh, like what Stephanie was on about in the charity she's on about are people who are in very remote places in third world countries, and we can't organize any infrastructure or any load of food to go up to those people. It's way up in the, you know, it's way up in the fucking in Nepal, up in the mountains. and. Basically, anyway, it's a bit of they're out of the way. What I'm, but what the point she is making is places like that can get the food provided. They have enough, you know, sixty dollars to them is a lot, a lot of money. Whereas it's not to us, like you know what I mean. So those type of people could be arranged with donations so they can get the food and sort the things out themselves or whatever, or get seed to plant or whatever. But you, you're covering what I was on about. We, you have to, in the car, you know, like in the current countries like ourselves in Europe and. America is the infrastructure has to be completely redesigned. So you're, you're carrying on with that, anyway. So it's done. I, I would just like to add, if it's okay, that I would, um, I was thinking about that as you were saying it, but maybe again, code word, uh, when everything goes back to the new normal, um, maybe we can. Uh, volunteer training programs because they they have so food sources their own natural food sources you know and it's actually to them naturally vegan anyway um it's it's they don't have the people because like that they are up in the mountains they don't have the people to walk up and do that so it's just the money they need to just to cover what they used to cover with the volunteers they'll pay their own petrol and travel themselves etc but maybe we can uh, just get, say, oh, here's a tra training program you can incorporate with your own restaurants because they already have that in mind. They're they're driven. They're already doing the work. But maybe just say, here's an idea we came up with. Maybe we can incorporate that with the app or something like that. You know, so maybe just reach out to these charities and say, this is our idea. Once it's all up and running, obviously, but it just could be something to incorporate. Maybe like a little training program or something like that. I don't know what you would call it. But. Well, um. Definitely. Amen to all of that. And, you know, part of this decentralized planetary network, part of the function of the, um, you know, the virtual call center where people can call in. Like, for, let me give you a perfect example. When I was in high school, I didn't have a lot of money, but when I heard about the famine in Ethiopia, right, I wanted to donate to that to help them, you know, buy, because I knew they could buy bulk rice, beans, whatever, and probably feed hundreds of people with whatever I could donate. And so I called up to inquire 
And I got through to a woman who told me, well, where they're being hard, where they're hardest hit right now is not in Ethiopia, but next door in Eritrea. So if I were you, I would donate your money to the Eritrean uh, Relief Committee. And that's what I did. I donated all the money I had so that they, these starving kids who I was seeing on television could eat. Likewise, you're going to have people calling in and saying, what, you know, where is my, where is my money going to have the most impact? It could be that what you mentioned there in, in Nepal um, is where it might have the most impact because that's where it'll buy the most pounds of dried beans and dried rice that can feed a whole orphanage for 60 bucks a month. Right? So what we need to do is put together this planetary network and we're doing it right now. I mean, what's happening right here in this meeting is literally the, you know, one of the beginnings of it, one of the early pillars of this planetary network. It has to start somewhere. And it's starting in this conversation, this transformational conversation that's transforming us and transforming the world. Again, it has to start somewhere. And we have to do this. This is not optional. Let me tell you why. If we don't do this and we continue with the market economy, the market-based economy, right, um, where everyone runs out of food and everyone runs out of money and no one has work, right, and you have a few sociopaths hoarding all the food and hoarding all the land and hoarding all the money, right, you're going to get a pitchfork scenario. The people are going to come at the sociopaths with pitch with pitchforks, <laughs> right? Uh, so, and th that's basically a Mad Max scenario, right? And we simply cannot afford to go into Mad Max mode um, when we've got a planet to cool down. That's going to require tremendous cooperation, coordination and a functioning, functioning economy to support it, to support the, de, the manufacture and deployment of you know, millions of square kilometers of reflective material, reflective infrastructure. We need to do that like ASAP especially with the loss of global dimming. But the only way that we're going to get the world to coordinate together is if we're taking care of each other and no child left behind, no elder left behind, no one left behind. And that will bring the world into a state of unity and togetherness, right? Look, if, the, if, if, two parts of a family or groups of friends or whatever are having some conflict, right? The best way to resolve it is get them all together and have a big meal, right? We eat, we drink, we smoke, we whatever. We work it out just by hanging together. In fact, we don't even have to talk about the thing. We just need to hang together. So with the food delivery, We'll be able to, we'll all be eating the same plant-based foods, delicious, nutritious plant-based foods, and we'll, we'll all be hanging together. The world will come together to share a meal. Three times a day, every day. It'll be one nonstop block party. We'll take care of the food. Just come to the party. Let's just listen for the doorbell. We'll take care of the food. Just come to the party. We've reached a moment where it's to do or not to do. We know what we have to do. It's now glaringly obvious what we have to do and how and why. And it's either do or don't do at this point. So we're now configuring ourselves to do.
and there's a lot that needs to be figured out. That's why I want to go over these uh, different topics. Um, so we're coming upon uh, two hours into the meeting of an eight hour meeting. Um, I'm learning to pace myself <laughs> because I also had an almost two hour meeting earlier this morning. We started at 7 a.m. and went to like quarter to nine. I mean, it was awesome, I mean, but that's when everyone could do it. So got up early and did it. <laughs> Took a little nap, here I am. Um, so what I'd like to propose is at the top of the hour, maybe we take a break for, I don't know, 20 minutes? We'll, 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 we'll kick around some numbers and see what makes sense. Um, and then we can jump back into it. But before we break, um, I was thinking to just rattle through the list of topics related to all this, related to this food sourcing preparation and delivery program to end hunger and end pandemics. Um, and then just imagine a different, you know, weekly or, um, you know, twice a week meeting or what with whatever frequency that groups meet to focus on each of these topics and each of these, some of them are perspectives, right? Others are groups, others are technology. Anyway, here, here, here's the list. Okay. So each of these, just think of each of these as topics on a topic map. So you have medical and healthcare, nutrition, recipes, and meal planning for the food that's going to be delivered, agriculture, restaurants, government, Churches and religion, nonprofit organizations, thank you, Stephanie, technology, the whole environmental sector, that whole sector, um, permaculture and living uh, food forests, veganism. The arts, radical inclusivity, the story, the narrative, the marketing, the PR. I'm just going to put that all under the story. What's the story? What's the scoop? As we say here in the Americas, what's the scoop, dude? So, dude, what's the scoop? What's the scoop? Good. Volunteers. Hey, I want to volunteer. How do I do it? Can I do it from home? Da 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 da. -da. What about safety? Um, another whole topic is neighborhoods and local communities. And finally, the overall strategy for this whole big thing, which is really what we've been talking about today, the whole big picture, right? Now. What I'm imagining, okay, is that as we get this going and the dominoes start falling city by city by city by city all over the world, they start feeding their people, right? Um, that more and more people are going to find out how did this come into being and they're going to find out about the collective intelligence behind it. They're going to join the collective intelligence. The collective intelligence is going to grow by leaps and bounds exponentially. And what we're going to experience is the world together in a vast network of hyper-connected meetings, conversations like this one that are ongoing. We get together every week on the Solution Club. We get together every week on the Block Party. So um, The world is going to experience what it's like for all of us to eat. That's going to be a new experience. Get ready for a new experience. You and all of your brothers and sisters eating every day, three times a day. Get ready for that new experience. Okay? Get ready for that. 
And so when we get together in conversation, we're going to have an experience of being a united humanity, unlike we've ever had before. So get ready for that too. So what are the two things I'm asking you to get ready for? Number one, get ready for when you eat, everybody eats. Get ready for that. And then get ready for humanity coming together and experiencing togetherness and the collective. So lots of good stuff to get ready for. It's now top of the hour. I didn't necessarily mean to end right at the top of the hour, but it's, it is what it is. Any quick comments or questions before we go into the afore promised break? And among the comments I'm, I'm requesting are, how long of a break do people need? I was thinking like 20 minutes, but that was just my initial thought. Could be less, could be more. What do people need? What do people want? Emery says 20. I see a thumbs up from James. All right. I see my sister Jackie making a face. Oh, there's her thumbs up. <laughs> All right. You were looking for the thumbs up button. Dot says good with her. Awesome. Thank you, Natalie. All right. Everybody likes the idea of 20 minutes. Okay. So at 20 after, it's now one after. So 20 after, 21 after. And um, I'm going to stop recording. And Maida and Jackie, if you can stick around for a minute, let's just make it 22 after. That's kind of a lucky number. So, but Jackie and, My and uh, Myra, if you could stick around for a minute, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>